Back in October 2021, we checked out a brand new enterprise called Xlinx that had the extremely ambitious goal of bringing an almost constant supply of electricity all the way from the desert of South Morocco to the shores of the United Kingdom via huge subsea high voltage direct current transmission lines. The target was to provide enough power for about 7 million UK homes. The company even planned to build its own production facility to produce these 16,000 kilometres of cabling required for the project. No shortage of risk in that endeavour then, eh? So the question is, three years on, with a global pandemic and an economic crash behind us, and with arguably one of the most volatile global commodities markets in decades, how is the X-Links project holding up so far? Hello, and welcome to Just Have a Think. The original video that I mentioned a moment ago gives a pretty good idea of the magnitude of the X-Links project, and I've left a link to it in the description section so you can jump back and have a look if you haven't already seen it. To put a bit more flesh on the bones of that presentation, I recently visited the £10 million research centre of Octopus Energy, who as well as being Britain's largest electricity supplier, also just happened to be the most recent company to invest in the X-Links project. While I was there, I was lucky enough to be joined by the new X-Links Morocco CEO, James Humphrey, and also the chief executive of Octopus Energy itself, Greg Jackson. Back in 2021, X-Links had identified 1,500 square kilometres of unused and unallocated land out in the Moroccan desert that was deemed suitable to build out 8 gigawatts of solar panels, another 3.5 gigawatts of wind power, and a 5 gigawatt, 22.5 gigawatt hour battery energy storage installation. To give a bit of context to those numbers, Britain's world leading offshore wind capacity in 2023 was just short of 15 gigawatts. So even without the batteries, this one single site in Morocco will increase that capacity by roughly two thirds. So the new CEO has quite a challenge on his hands. Imagine uh, a piece of land the size of Greater London, and then that will have 11 and a half gigawatts of solar and wind power, five gigawatts of battery, and then the electricity will go 100 kilometers to the sea, 4,000 kilometers, hugging the coast uh, through uh, Portugal, Spain, okay. uh, France, and uh, arriving in Devon. And then that's where it connects to the UK grid. So why, why Morocco? Why have you chosen Morocco? What's, what's so good about the, the, the situation there? Yeah, the, I think two things. First of all, the Morocco government has shown great foresight with the renewable industry. And over the last decade, it's developed its own uh, renewable power uh, set of projects and for domestic use and built a lot of capability. And it has the foresight to see the opportunity in exporting renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And then I think secondly, when you look at it from a wind and solar perspective, the solar's got great irradiation, as you might imagine, yeah. uh, that far south and in, in, in the desert, 20% more than Spain, for example. Right. And then even better, the wind is a, a trade or convection wind, which means it comes in the evening. And it's not at all correlated or linked to the type of wind we get in Northern Europe. Okay. So it, can, it, it is windy on a constant basis, and that helps us supply you know, electricity when the UK needs it, especially in the evenings. And is that because, is the convection because of a, a, as a result of the sun heating up the atmosphere in the daytime and then that, that moves up and exactly. causes a movement of air? Exactly, and therefore it's much more reliable and you don't get these periods right. of weeks where cyclonic wind you know, doesn't blow. Yeah, right. So it's, it, in that sense, it's much more constant. There's enough sunshine down there in Morocco to provide a significant contribution from solar PV to the UK's daytime grid and charge up the five gigawatt battery bank. That means when the wind dies down in the early hours of each morning, the batteries can seamlessly kick in and keep the electrons flowing during our country's off-peak hours. So ostensibly, great news for UK homes. But what about the people of Morocco? What's in it for them? The overall vision is very much about benefits for everyone involved, yeah. both sides. So, you know, speaking about Morocco specifically, then you have enormous foreign direct investment, you have export um, revenue, you have local jobs, sort of both in terms of construction, 10,000 jobs at least, 2,000 in operations, and then you have the building out of local industry to supply yes, uh, and to set up 
as part of the wider green industrialized agenda of Morocco, supply chains, local supply chains, factories with, with even more jobs. So when you then get into the sort of indirect multipliers, you know, it is, yeah. helps you know, transition Morocco um, you know, industrially as well. So all of those are at play. In terms of the local community, yes, on the site, no one lives on the site. It's, right. It is pretty remote. Uh, but there are um, sort of villages with, you know, within a number of kilometers. We have uh, some from the team who's, who's, who's from there, uh, lives locally, and you know, to okay. sort of talk to them uh, so that we can also build community support. You know, and talking to them, they're, they're probably most interested in, in A, jobs, and B, the chance to, to you know, potentially sell things to the uh, workers on site. And, and so those okay. are the sorts of yeah, things that are, that are on their mind. Now, right at the start of the video, I mentioned one or two minor hiccups in the entire global geopolitical and economic system. Those events inevitably push back the activity of just about every major development company in the world. And of course, X-Links was no exception. Yeah, so a lot of things have, have happened and, and are now ongoing. We've been surveying on the actual site itself in Morocco for over two years, sort of doing wind and, and solar measurements. Right. We've done surveying across the route where it will move through Morocco, so to, to the sea. And then we've got surveying uh, that's been happening uh, last year, and we've currently got vessels in the water now along the sea route. So currently off the coast of France, uh, you'll see a, a GOXYZ vessel. And okay. you know, we're, we're beginning to get uh, all of that coming in. Um, we're also looking at environmental surveys. It's all linked to permitting as well. Yeah. So geophys sort of surveys are happening as well. Meanwhile, back here in Blighty, there's another work stream ongoing to ensure everything gets properly permitted, regulated and connected when the time comes. All very much going ahead. One of the early successes for the project was the uh, national grid acceptance. I and mean, in fact, we've just had the modified application approved last month. So uh, that's all in place um, and that's worked very well. And then we have a relatively short distance, about 14 kilometers. Uh, in Devon as it comes onshore and then into the uh, where the substation is, National right, Grid substation. Right. We're totally focused on getting operational delivery within the decade and then you sort of work backwards from that. When I first spoke to the X-Lynx Group CEO, Simon Morris, back in 2021, the estimated cost of the entire project was in the region of £16 billion, with £40 million having already been secured for the development phase from a group of 20 investors perhaps most significant of which was a German company called Con Energy, which has more than 25 years experience investing in numerous sustainable infrastructure and energy supply projects, including companies like the global charging infrastructure leader ChargePoint and many other startups. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the reason James and I were sitting in Octopus Energy's UK Research Centre was that Octopus are also now an investor in the X-Links project. So I was keen to understand directly from their visionary CEO, Greg Jackson, exactly why he feels this kind of infrastructure is something we should be shooting for here in the UK. Yeah, you know, um, years ago, I was speaking to a friend who worked in oil and gas. His job was doing the, the legals, negotiating for pipelines uh, to carry oil from one country to another. Right. And I said, like, is there a reason we don't do this with electricity? You know, because you see all these kind of images on the internet they'll show you like a tiny bit of the Sahara yeah. and they'll say, you know, solar uh, this size could power the world. You know, well, why don't we do that? Yeah. Um, and it's quite interesting actually, because, you know, he said, well, it'll probably be easier for electricity than oil and gas because, you know, it's, it's kind of less leaky. Um, yeah. uh, but no one at the time had really looked at the value of it and uh, I guess uh, all the power and the investment were going into fossil fuels. Mm. But as we're electrifying, hopefully everything, um, we need to ask about you know how do we power heat pumps in winter, um, you know when it's not windy, yeah. uh, and we need to answer those questions. And and you revisit that old question, say like you know could we ship electricity around the world the way we ship oil and gas? And it turns out uh, not only can we, but there was this company Xlinx that were looking at doing it. And um, you know when I met them, I, I was just blown away mm. by the amount of progress they'd made in creating the outline of, of the project, the finances, and the coalition of talent they brought together, mm -hmm. some incredibly uh, accomplished people. And yeah. so actually, w what this is all about is not trying to meet the needs of the system as it is today, 
but to meet the needs of the system we're building. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, or if you just take a keen interest in green energy generally, then you will no doubt already be aware that solar PV prices have tumbled more than 80% in the last decade or so. So projects like X-Links serve as a great example of how interconnectors can overcome at least one of the remaining concerns among renewable energy detractors and sustainable technology laggards, which is their obsession with intermittency. Battery energy storage is already dealing with much of the short term, so-called frequency regulation to keep our grid stable, of course, and the price of that technology is also dropping like a stone. But interconnectors offer a whole new dimension of energy delivery security. According to this recent analysis by the independent energy think tank Ember, Europe's electricity system is already the world's largest interconnected grid, with more than 400 interconnectors linking nearly 600 million citizens. The current interconnected capacity of 93 gigawatts is expected to grow to 136 gigawatts by 2030 and 155 gigawatts by 2040. The Ember report points out that forward-looking planning decisions taken now will lock in place cost-effective interconnections that will bring multiple co-benefits for all the countries involved. So in that respect, the X-Links project looks very well set to play a major role in the future of UK energy security and perhaps even to become a template for similar projects all over the world. Now, I'm sure you have your own views on all these developments, so as always, the place to leave your thoughts is in the comments section below. And I very much look forward to seeing what the consensus view is. By the way, you can watch the full unedited interviews with Greg Jackson and James Humphrey exclusively over at our Patreon page, where you can also get early access to all my videos and have your say on the direction of the channel via monthly content polls. And the link to that page will be on the end screen of this video and also in the description section. That's it for this week though. A massive thank you to all our existing Patreon supporters, of course, without whom this channel quite simply would not exist. And if you don't want to miss out on notifications of new videos each week, then make sure you click on that subscribe button. It won't cost you a penny to do that, and it's just a simple click away, either down there somewhere or on that icon there. As always though, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week, and remember to just have a think. See you next week.